On today's World Inside, with preparations for the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics in full swing, the 100-day countdown begins for the Paralympics Winter Games. And UNESCO's commitment to sustainability and biodiversity protection, in the words of the UNESCO Director of the Regional Science Bureau for Asia and the Pacific, Shabazz Khan. Modern contemporary Chinese literature with a broad global appeal. Find out why from the editorial director of the New York Review of Books Classic Series. My first introduction to Chinese culture was through Chinese poetry. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. The Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics is just around the corner. Preparations are in full swing with an eye on logistics, construction and transportation. Efforts to spruce up the Chinese capital before the big event are also quite visible. And with exactly 100 days to go for the Beijing 2022 Paralympic Winter Games, final countdown and celebration begin as the city is set to make history to host both the Summer and Winter Olympics. And I was honored to host the 100 Day to Go celebrations for the Beijing 2022 Paralympic Winter Games. Let's wish it a great success. The UNESCO General Conference wrapped up today on November 24th in Paris. It hosted diverse events on empowerment, education and sustainability. Earlier at the COP15 meeting in Kunming, I talked to Shabazz Khan, the director of the UNESCO Regional Science Bureau for Asia and the Pacific. As global leaders have threshed out new nature conservation commitments, international organizations like UNESCO are at forefront for biodiversity protection efforts, calling for global collective action. Let's listen in. We are facing urgency, and earlier the plan for example, for 2020, most of them, the goals are not being fulfilled. We have now realized that there is no way other than finding better coexistence between uh, nature and humans. So that's where, uh, as we are going to, towards the last decade of the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 of them, we are looking into what should be post-2020 targets for uh, biodiversity. Still, many parts of the world are struggling uh, with the loss of biodiversity. There are many estimates which say that we are losing one species a minute because we don't even have all the record of what exists on Earth, what exists under the ocean. Our sustainable development goal number 14, which is about life underwater, uh, the oceans, and goal number 15, which is about life above uh, water, we have to set up. Uh, the baselines in many of these areas, that's where the national park system, for example, in China is a very in important uh, development. Right. And the leadership of President Xi Jinping uh, putting ecological civilization at the heart of the development. So I think we need to now um, very carefully take stock of uh, where are those barriers which we have been going through, mm -hmm. where are the hot spots in the world, what are those species which need a lot more protection and what, what we can do to uh, not only to conserve the species but to improve the whole biosphere around, around them. Like uh, a very great example in China is the Henan Gibbon, a very success story where very few uh, now with the successful conservation efforts of the Henan government, uh, their numbers are rising. Or the excellent story of the pandas, uh, where from being threatened to vulnerable status has been achieved. So there are so, so many good things to learn from, but there are so many difficult uh, areas around the world as well, like uh, my own uh, home country, Pakistan, where we are, we are struggling also uh, with the blind dolphins along the Indus River. And there are many other examples like the orangutans in uh, uh, Sumatra. So there are big areas and areas uh, in Africa where we have many of these challenges of the survival of the great apes. So it's, the, the world is not a safe place for everyone. And uh, environment 
has a very legitimate uh, right on this planet, which we have recognized and we are recognizing more and more. And we need to put in place practices which can move us faster for the conservation of these uh, areas where these important species are living and bringing this thinking in the minds of the people that it's about the biosphere, right. it's about uh, coexistence between human and nature. Mm -hmm. We have to take care of the whole uh, landscape. We need to take a landscape approach. How do we do that? We need to make sure there is proper vegetation, but it's not only the trees which are the solution. We need to make sure the industry, which is very important for our growth, is located in locations and all the affluents which are coming are properly treated. We need to take care that the citizens are doing the right thing through their education, but also making sure the housing uses lesser energy, right. lesser use of water. The agriculture is non-polluting. There are ways in which we can use much lesser land, much lesser fertilizers, much lesser energy, and we can produce more. So we need to carefully understand on this planet Earth what is a reasonable use of resources by the humans, mm -hmm and how do we take care of uh, all who are also part of this uh, uh, ecological system. Ideas like this idea of ecological civilization is a very beautiful idea that you have the ecological which is very important, all the species, all the flora, fauna, whatever we have in the world, and the civilization which is not only today, the civilization where we were in the past, where we are now, where we go to future. So, uh, it's an interesting system. People need to uh, study more and learn more about China before they can apply such models. The issues related to non-transparency, the issues related to corruption, those issues must be addressed everywhere in the world. And to address those uh, issues, there must be very transparent leadership with very uh, good vision for the future. And there must be people who are willing to follow uh, those transparent systems and be uh, part of those solutions. Mm -hmm. So environment uh, cannot uh, sustain itself unless there are proper governance systems. And those governance systems need to take care of the people on ground, need to take care of the important assets. Like for example, uh, while it seems a very uh, maybe interesting uh, kind of philosophy, uh, the uh, areas like uh, our green mountains, our green rivers, our, our golden mountains and our silver rivers, uh, these are not just uh, uh, important from the point of view of a philosophy. Mm -hmm. Now with the role of the heritage, the role of rural revitalization, how can we bring more emphasis to ecotourism? How can we have alternate li livelihoods? How can we take care of our local and indigenous communities? And we can take care of them if our uh, landscapes uh, are healthy landscapes, if our mountains are properly maintained, and if our, if our ecological systems are thriving. So everything uh, links together in the uh, long run. And very importantly for China and the China's work with others like the One Belt, One Road, very important initiative of the Chinese government. How can we bring these benefits of ecological civilization to the other countries in Asia Pacific, in Africa? Yes. To bring that, we need more South-South cooperation. We need to have institutions like Chinese Academy of Sciences in other countries. We need to have link between the universities in China and the universities in other parts of the world. And you're watching World Insight coming up. Modern and contemporary Chinese literature with a broad global appeal. Let's find out why from Edwin Frank, editorial director of the New York Review of Books classic series. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Nowadays, with a wealth of modern literary works on Chinese classical heritage and modern life, modern and Chinese contemporary literature is poised to help reshape the global cultural landscape, some say. These books not only convey powerful traditional Chinese stories and heritage, but also influence what the world reads and ultimately what people care about. With this in mind, I talked to Edwin Frank on the significance of Chinese traditional cultural exchanges. Mr. Frank is the editorial director of the New York Review of Books of Classical Series. The New York Review of Books 
has published the works of many Chinese writers, including Ge Fei's acclaimed work, Peach Blossom Paradise. Let's listen in. Now I'm joined by Edwin Frank, editorial director of NYRB Classics. What a pleasure to see you, Edwin. Pleasure to see you. Congratulations uh, to this uh, series of classics that you have rediscovered. And among them, there are many Chinese names from ancient China to contemporary China. I am, among other things, also a poet. And I suppose my first introduction to Chinese culture was through Chinese poetry, which in some sense, um, at the beginning of, of modern poetry in English, is Ezra Pound's response to poetry in Chinese, mm. uh, which I, I think Chinese experts often say it gets everything wrong, but <laughs> in some sense it helped to uh, to shape um, modern poetry in America and England in English in general uh, around uh, uh, around images of the sort that that are are so frequent in Chinese poetry. Mm. So I think perhaps the first Chinese book that I published um, in the classic series was a reprint of a wonderful book from the 1960s by this British scholar A.C. Graham, his translation of um, Poets of the Late Tang, which starts with the late poetry of Du Fu and uh, also Li Xiangyin, a, a whole range of poets. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful book, um, both because the translations are beautiful, but also because um, Graham does a very good job explaining how differently Chinese poetry works from English poetry. I know you yourself and, as a poet. So how differently? Well, something that was very interesting for uh, an American reader of poetry was that, again, partly influenced by Pant, one, one saw Chinese poetry as a kind of uh, series of, of limpid and transparent and simple images. And Graham made it clear that what works at one level as a direct image of physical reality, at another level, uh, works as a historical illusion, so that the poems are suffused with history as well as um, imagery. Besides that, you are also publishing works related to contemporary China, to modern China. Elaine Chang's Indeed. work, for example, she is a well-known name in uh, the Chinese community around the world, and yet to English readers, even though she wrote in English uh, on some occasions, but not well known. So how did you discover her? What about her that made you echo in a way? I often say that for me, she is the, the great discovery of, of the 20 some years that I've spent working uh, uh, editing the classic series. Mm -hmm. um, she is, she of course lived in the United States for a, a long time, uh, but um, but she wasn't really well published in the United States, and I discovered her in a reference work. Uh, I think it was the Oxford Book of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Literature in English Translation, and perhaps it was even in a footnote where it said that her story, the, which is translated, she translated as the Golden Kang, uh, was the equal of. Uh, Thomas Mann's Death in Venice, and I can't remember, maybe Kafka's Metamorphosis, I don't know what. But in any case, what was interesting to me, th these are standard comparisons of a great, a great novella, mm -hmm. but I had never heard of it. And I went to the library at Columbia University, the East Asian Library, and, uh, and went into, uh, really, I had to go deep into it to find uh, this anthology in which this translation she had done of her own story was included mm -hmm. and was immediately uh, struck by what a wonderful writer this was, a writer who, um, again, beautiful imagery, but extraordinarily filmic sense of time. You know, just look at her life as a writer and as a woman could very mm -hmm. well, uh, in a way, inform your readers about what mm -hmm. China was like and went through, you know, for the past mm -hmm. the uh, 30 years uh, during modern China, you know, the early 20th century. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what about the others? Yes, well, I mean, I'm always interested in, in dealing with the foreign literature in trying to get a picture 
of how that literature has existed over time and into our time. Mm. So on the one hand, having Goethe, who is writing about uh, both historical novels like Peach Blossom Paradise, but also uh, novels of contemporary life in, in Beijing, like uh, 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 Invisibility Cloak. These works are part of your, what you call the New York Review of Books classic project, in which mm -hmm. you try to rediscover all the quote unquote long buried classics and made them mm -hmm. available in front of the mm -hmm. world who are hungry for real works and for masterpieces. So. Um, <laughs> and it has been a great success despite of earlier doubts many had about this. You know, it's a commercial success. It is certainly a great intellectual success. So tell me how you do this because I remember you describe, uh, you know, how to let people know about these works by saying, I don't want to promote them as the quote unquote, uh, old Sex in the City book, because they're not, mm -hmm. and the readers are smart. Tell me more about that. How did you, you know, explore these ideas? Well, it's of course, it's a mainstay of, of, Amer of American publishing, publishing everywhere that you need to uh, connect a book to some current book to make people take any uh, take an interest in it. They, it it's done all the time, yeah. and um, and of course with contemporary books there is some legitimacy to that, saying that this book is like that book, um, and even of course uh, past books. But readers are smart, and readers know that that you know a book from 1920 is not going to be the same thing as a very very current book like mm -hmm. Sex and the City. Finding out what is. Um, I mean, it's it's interesting. I, I mean, I've said at a certain point that I want the books to be powerfully irrelevant in that kind of pushing back against the notion that books should books from the past should immediately reproduce our ideas of the present. There's a wonderful moment uh, in a great book from the past, which I don't publish, Nadezhda Mandelstam's memoir, Hope Against Hope. She was the wife of the Russian poet Osip Mandelstam where uh, she describes the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova saying, what do you want? And she says, I want a place where you'll find none of us. She's mm -hmm. fed up with, with just hearing all the chit chat and talk and the, the opinionation of the moment. And so there is a way in which work from uh, more or less recent past to the deep past can surprise us and, su and astonish us out of our, um, our preconceptions and in some ways set us free to think again. And this, in the case of the classics, I don't want people to think this is something you have to read in the class and have to say, this is good. Mm -hmm. I want people to say, this is something that raises questions about either books or how we see the world. Does it help you to how you see the world as the editor of this uh, series of classics? Well, I mean, it has taught me all sorts of things uh, that I just, by virtue of snooping around and hearing from scholars and writers and translators and so on, I have found out about literatures about which I knew very little, uh, Hungarian literature and mm. things like that, which have beautiful, beautiful and very unusual uh, works, which, um, so in that sense, it is a continuing pleasure and education you know, I mean, the Latin poets said that, uh, Horace said that literature is supposed to instruct and delight, and I have been instructed and delighted by the work that I've done over the, uh, the last 20 years. You, you've been saying, Edwin, before I came into the studio, I did a little bit of research, you said, you want thing that is powerfully irrelevant. I like mm -hmm. that. Um, I think you might have put a lot of thoughts into it before you said that. Tell me more about that, and how is that related to where we are today? It's an interesting time that we are both perhaps more broadly interested in people all over the world than ever before, but we aren't terribly interested or, and I think increasingly aren't terribly knowledgeable about the past. And as a book that I publish famously begins with the sentence, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. So the past, not only our own past, but the past of, of other, other countries and languages past, are other places where we can learn to think differently and think differently about ourselves. And we would not, in our busyness and 
uh, engagement with the questions of the day, of our day, the things that seem to us immediately relevant, necessarily ask those questions. Mm -hmm. or And literature can ask them for us and ask us to listen to them. Mm -hmm. History, if you look at history per se, uh, it really helps us to understand the most two or three versions of what happened. And it usually mm -hmm. is being written by winners, so to speak. And yes. yet literature really complement what history has been about by describing yeah. quote unquote little people, uh, you know, ordinary people, uh, yeah. real people. That, that is well, really amazing and, and treasurable. Eileen Chang, I think, said that, uh, uh, you know, that, that her inspiration and what she was interested in doing at a time when I think uh, many writers uh, uh, felt that they had to write about historic events, she was interested in the little things that happened between men and women. And, um, uh, and, uh, and my understanding is that that actually, the word she gave, uh, that, that connects with the old Chinese word for the novel, which is something like small talk. <laughs> um, the uh, and uh, or translates as something like small talk, mm -hmm. but of course, small things are really very big things. Small mm. things shape our days, and and shape shape our world. Mm. Every individual has a tremendous amount of stories about them. Um, yeah. About you, yeah. you also have quite oh. some stories. Tell me about how this you know cooperation with other publishing houses, particularly from a very different culture now. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. even the two countries, if you talk about politics, it could be very different. You know, mm -hmm. how does this cooperation about culture, about language, about literature, amid a bigger picture of geopolitics, technology, mm -hmm. you know, all the changes that we have today? Well, it's interesting, because literature, on the one hand, um, uh, I mean, I think is is a space apart from that, and it's important that there be a space apart from uh, the political and ideological uh, disputes that exist between countries, and and also the historical. The very uh, it's not least because it's a place where, in fact, the larger historical uh, origins of those disputes and the human experience that goes into those disputes can be recognized. Mm. Um, uh, and I mean, there's a way in which a book, you know, um, the philosopher Martin Buber talked about the importance of an I, thou, to use an old English word, but an I, you relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and literature constitutes that relationship and constitutes it across boundaries, even as it uh, doesn't deny boundaries. It, it also is a record of the very different things that happen to people and countries. Now I know you are working on the book about the 20th century novel. Mm -hmm. It is very relevant to me in a way because mm -hmm. I really want to know how literature is helping us to discover and rediscover the 20th century. Some of us went through a little bit of, mm -hmm. it was a dramatic time. Tell mm -hmm. me more about how much you have researched and where are you today? Well, as you say, the 20th century was a time of, of uh, a, a catastrophic and disastrous time in many ways, but also a time of great opportunity in other ways, and of emerging new ways of understanding things and, you know, and, and things that have benefited our lives, which are as simple as electricity or, uh, you know, female suffrage, um, obviously, that which is um, so... Um, uh, I mean, in, in sitting down to write this book, what I was really interested in is, is how literature, not in a specifically documentary sense, but in a, an imaginative sense, went on responding to these emerging, changing realities of the last century. And realities that, as they, that in some sense made the novel one of, perhaps the, certainly the preeminent form of imaginative literature in our world, all around the world because at the beginning of the century in some ways the novel was an entertainment for more or less advanced industrial uh, at the time industrial societies where you because you need a printing press to make a novel in effect and you need enough readers who are literate yeah. to make a novel sellable 
by the end of the century, the novel was all over the world and is in some sense our story had become the story of what kind of world we live in. Mm. Um, and so this uh, and the different ways in which people thought about how to, t how to uh, deal with that were, are things that interest me throughout the book. You know, Mr. Frank, during the 20th century, we went through several wars. Mm, we big, did. <laughs> small. Uh, and then we also were tied up by certain ideologies, fed up mm -hmm. by certain ideologies, confused by ideologies, um, and society changes. Technology is coming in at, in a much mm -hmm. faster speed than any other time, one could say. Mm -hmm. So how has all of this, have all of this been reflected in literature? Literature, particularly novel, did they really capture the spirit of the time? Well, I mean, it, it has been the, the struggle, I mean, it is what I'm calling the 20th century novel, which is not every novel written in the 20th century. Many mm. novels are escapes from the 20th century, and escape is a perfectly understandable thing, given the century the 20th century was. Mm. Uh, but whether you start with somebody like H.G. Wells, uh, who, you know, is, of course, right at the beginning of the century, trying to imagine a new kind of literature, science fiction, which will imagine the effects that technology will have mm -hmm. on our lives in the future, or whether we take, um, uh, excuse me again for my, but Zhang Zhengsheng, I think, is the fortress besieged, the great, who is writing about his hero displaced by the war in China mm -hmm. and working across uh, a, a war-torn China, uh, but is at the same time writing an extraordinary social comedy of people displaced socially in so many ways and trying to make sense of their lives and also emotionally displaced because it's also a great novel of, of unhappy marriage. Mm. Um, the, uh, the, we, um, you, you have somebody dealing with, what's the phrase, it's a 20th century phrase, the facts on the ground <laughs> of our uh, day-to-day of, of, of -day existence, which is often a question of combat. Very interesting discussion. Edwin Frank, editorial director of NYRB Classics. What a pleasure. Congratulations for your wonderful work. Edwin Frank, editorial editor of the New York Review of Books Classic Series. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of the team. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.